Psalm 2, the reign of the Lord's anointed. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. This is the word of the Lord. And we say thanks be to God for his word. We always begin our time together with God's word as a recognition um, one is a call to worship, but also as a realization that it is God that initiates with us. And particularly as we're doing these Old Testament stories, it's a great reminder to us that God is the primary character of the entire Bible. And so as we start our worship service, we are reminded of that. We'll look at the scriptures together today um, through the book of Daniel. And then also at the end of the service, we end with God's having the final word as well. Well, before we dive into our scripture for today, let me just say welcome. It is so wonderful that you are online with us whether that is at some other time, but especially for those of you that are with us live on Sunday morning um, at 10 a.m., would you please go ahead and just say something in the uh, chat right now? One, that is a huge encouragement for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. As the, as the Bible says in Hebrews, let us not neglect meeting together. And this is the way in which we are meeting together right now. And so, one, I encourage you to do that just because it is an encouragement to see your, your names, to remember your faces, uh, to hear your voices in the text that you're writing there. Uh, it's a huge encouragement. And then second, we were talking about this as a session. You know what? It's very difficult during this time when we're not having regular in-person gatherings to check in on people. And yes, we've got the elders have called through um, our members and regular attenders and the deacons are doing that on a regular basis. And actually, they're getting ready to deliver some Christmas and Thanksgiving baskets. We have ways in which we know and we engage with people, but it is difficult. And so one of the ways we can know that you are engaged, that you're still here with us in the midst of all of this, is that you could just say hi real quick. And you could just say something over there in, in the chat. And if you're not a big talker, if you're more of an introvert, hey, it's very easy. Just write H-I. That's very helpful. Um, Tommy and I, of course, are in the live chat right now with you as well. Speaking of worship services, I know many of you, um, I would be surprised if anyone did it, wasn't aware that Governor Inslee passed some new restrictions this past Sunday, um, which has caused us to kind of delay our next in-person service. So our next in-person service was going to be November the 29th. That is now going to be online only. And as a reminder, all of our services going forward from here, there will always be an online component, whether that's a pre-recorded sermon or whether it is once we are meeting in person, a live stream. You can always tune in 10 a.m. right here on our YouTube page or on our website, newhopekent.org, and be able to see the, the sermon as it is broadcast live. And then later it's available on here as well. So again, that November 29th service, that's going to be online. In fact, uh, the, the only one we have scheduled right now for in-person is Christmas Eve. There'll be more information coming uh, after Thanksgiving when, when staff comes back together and the session comes back together and is able to meet and discuss and talk. But we do want to make sure you get that information that is out there. The last thing I want to announce before we, we jump into the text is please let us pray for you. Whether you are a believer or not a believer, if you are watching this over uh, mom's shoulder, if you happen to accidentally click on the wrong YouTube link and you have been brought here in this moment right now, please give us the privilege to pray for you, whoever you are. It is, it is um, a privilege. It is an honor that we have that we can access the throne of God through Jesus and that we can pray on behalf of others. And we still gather together as staff on Tuesday uh, mornings via Zoom, and we still pray for people. We still send out the prayer list whenever we have a prayer request that is sent in. And you can go to newhopekent.org slash prayer. Fill that out. Let us know if you want it anonymous or if you want it uh, just for pastors or just for, if you want to limit the scope of it. 
Or if you want us to put that out to our prayer list where a number of people in our congregation can pray with you and for you. Well, today um, we continue our Jesus Storybook Bible um, series, Every, Whisper, Every Story excuse me, Whispers His Name. And the title for today is Daniel and the Scary Sleepover. And if you have the Storybook Bible, it's on page 159. If you don't have the Storybook Bible yet, I encourage you to buy it. We're going to be in this uh, through at least most of the spring. We're going to continue on through the Storybook Bible. It's not too late to grab a Storybook Bible. If you have a family with kids, read the story before the sermon or after the sermon. It's a great way to be engaged with your children. Um, if you are... If you don't have your storybook Bible and you want to follow along, and in fact, actually, as adults, I encourage you, please open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. This is the story of Daniel and the lion's den, um, and it is in Daniel chapter 6. And just to kind of set the historical context of what's happened so far, Assyria um, is this nation to the north of Israel, and they conquered um, the northern divided monarchy. At some point after uh, David, Solomon comes along and the, and the nation of Israel is divided into north and south. And the north is Israel and the south is referred to as Judah and the south is where Jerusalem is. And so the north has been conquered by Assyria. Well, as time goes on, eventually the Babylonians rise to power and the Babylonians come down, and I believe it's 586 B.C., if memory serves, and they sack Jerusalem. And so the entire, um, the entire Jewish people, the north and the south, the divided nation, both are conquered at this point. And as part of the Babylonian invasion, the exiles are taken back to Babylon. We're going to hit more about this in just a second. And then for those of you that are interested, and we're going to see this as we go forward, eventually Persia comes to power. They conquer the Babylonians, and under Cyrus, that's who eventually allows those later books of the Old Testament where they return back. But where we are is with Babylonian exile. And the first six chapters of Daniel are basically these deceptively simple stories about faith under pressure, extreme Pressure. Daniel and his three friends are forced to leave their homeland and to settle in the Babylonian king's palace. And they are compelled, they are forced to learn in this pagan nation um, these foreign ways in, pre in preparation to serve as government officials in the Babylonian empire and eventually in the Persian one. Um, and this is, again, a, a hostile force that has taken over and that has basically conquered their homeland, killed friends and family. And each chapter in the book of Daniel brings new challenges, and each time they rise to meet this crisis. This time in uh, the final chapter, it's not the final chapter of the book of Daniel, but the final of these six chapters that are about these crises of faith and how Daniel and his friends deal with them. The rest of Daniel, which we are, don't have time to address today, is more about prophecy uh, and ties to the book of Revelation and things like that. But in chapter six, Daniel and the lion den or Daniel and the sleepy, uh, the sleepy scare over the scary sleepover is in Daniel chapter six in and uh, we're big boys and girls. I'm going to read the whole chapter for us. I'll, if you uh, don't have that kind of attention span, pause it, talk amongst your home group, talk amongst your friends, and you can fast forward it. But I think that uh, the word of God is powerful. It goes out from him. And it, we have been brought to this chapter this morning for a reason. And there's not one specific passage in this chapter. The entire chapter is important in laying out this faith story. So I'm going to read it to us now. This is from Daniel chapter 6. It pleased Darius, the king at that time, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, and those are governors, basically, to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three presidents or administrators, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. 
And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the presidents and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O king Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction. Sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that this document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast in the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king established can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to the palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O oh, king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast in the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all people, 
nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what an amazing, amazing story. All of these officials, it sounds very <laughs> eerily similar to how government works today. There's this political scheme that is going on to try to remove Daniel. They set the king up. Uh, the king has to stick to the law once the law has been made. He's not allowed to revoke it. They put Daniel through this ordeal, which was common in the ancient Near East. Probably the thing that comes to mind for, for many of us that's, is, is, uh, is the idea of a water ordeal. They did this with the Salem witches. Um, they did this in the ancient Near East as if you threw someone into a river. If they died, then they were guilty. But if they survived, they were innocent. So the, the idea was that if Daniel could somehow survive this ordeal then he was being vindicated by a higher authority, by God or the gods themselves. Um, and, and that's what happens. Daniel survives the lion's den and his opponents and even their families are thrown in and the lions immediately eat them, showing it was not you know, something that could be written away, that they were overfed or something, something like that. So an amazing, amazing story. So a couple of things we want to hone in on. One is actually in the chapters leading up to this. And one is to recognize that Daniel and his friends are, one, living a faithful, quiet life, completely immersed in a pagan context. When it says, and we're going to get there, when it says that he prayed three times a day continually, it says that he did that um, as was his custom. It was not he heard this law and then ran up to his room to immediately break the law to make a statement. Daniel had been living his entire life in a pagan atmosphere and had done basically there's only two areas where he came at odds. One, which we're going to talk about, is the one here. And the other was a place about where uh, he decided to eat kosher. Um, and in both of those cases, he continue to live out his life in a, in a faithfully quiet way. In Daniel chapter 1, 3, we read about the situation that started all of this, how this all started. The king commanded Asphenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So basically what, has, what was going on here is that a hostile nation has conquered you. Now imagine, let's try to put this, it's hard for us to imagine because the United States has never really been in a place where we could imagine the United States proper being under foreign occupation. It's difficult for us to do that. But imagine for a moment that an, an enemy of sufficient power, let's say like China, for example, and I, I'm not trying to pick on, on, on China or the people in China or anything else. You could pick another nation. You want to pick Iran, North Korea, Russia. You have a country that has enough power and they actually are able to conquer the United States. They come and they take the youngest people of the nation. Imagine for a second that your friends, your family have been murdered. And when it says youth here, what we're talking about is someone at the max age 20, more likely younger than that. Why? 
because the reason that they would do this, and actually there's a, there's a Netflix show I don't recommend because it's inappropriate, um, called Barbarians, and the, it's based on a historical thing that happened the exact same thing. They would come and um, the, the Roman Empire did this too. They would come and they would steal the princes, the nobility. What did it say? Those people that youths without blemish, of good appearance, of good stock and nature. Going back to remember when Saul was selected as king, he was selected because he was tall and strong and good looking. Um, people that were intelligent, that were going to be able to serve them. And they would take these young noble nobles. Um, some people even say in the, in the extra canonical literature that Daniel was likely a relative of King Hezekiah at some point. Uh, in his family tree. And so you take those royalty. And in, in that TV show. They take the, uh, the basically the tribe chieftain's son. At a very young age. And I think in that show he's like six or seven years old. And they take him back to the Roman Empire. Um, in our imaginary scenario. It's like you get taken all the way back to Beijing. And you are raised there. And you, learn, you are completely and totally immersed in that culture, you learn Chinese, or you learn Latin, or you learn, in this case, the language of the Chaldeans. And you are eventually, at some point, here's the master plan behind this, is you take those natives that you have basically brainwashed, that you have given them a completely different worldview, you have raised them in the big city, uh, and this worked uh, better in, in the ancient, ancient, uh, ancient times, right? You're taking someone from the Germanic tribes to Rome. It is like another world, another reality. Same thing here. You're taking people from, from um, Israel and you're taking them back to the center of the known world at the time. The largest empire. And by the time the Persians come across, this thing spans, spans um, nations, languages, and peoples. And you, again, brainwash these people. You raise them so that they have a loyalty and they are raised by figures in that government. In the, in the Netflix show, one of the Roman prefects is who raises that child so that they feel like that guy is, is their father. Um, and then you send them back and when they go, they either do two things. They either stay there in that government and, and actually rule. They've been groomed and they've been raised up and they're the brightest and smartest and the best. And they're going to be in high positions of that government. The same government that conquered them and killed their people. Or, and this was, all, this was like kind of part of the master plan, is they send you back. And you become a governor, a satrap or a president or an administrator of the local area because what you know the people, you know the culture, you know the customs, you're less likely to have a rebellion, but you're intensely faithful to the people that, you've been, that have raised you your entire life. So imagine that sort of scenario. You, as a child, it'd be like my son Ezra, who's, who's seven years old, is taken and taken all the way over to China and Beijing. He's taught Chinese. He learns this new language. And he is raised over there and is told, you're going to follow all of these customs. And you think about that and you, you ask, what did, they, what did they do? Well, friends, frankly, they lived a quiet life. They, it is, and multiple commentators who I've read note this, it is kind of amazing one of the takeaways is how much they did not protest, how much they did not stand up against uh, the practices and the cultures and the things that were going on. They were completely and totally engulfed in the pagan culture. Daniel was fully educated in the ways of Babylon. And if you read the whole book of Daniel, you kind of can read between the lines. One of the things Babylon was known for was divination. It was known for looking at, this is Harry Potter stuff, looking at the shape of a liver or unusual births or the flight pattern of birds or stars and dreams and interpreting them. And guaranteed that if Daniel was going through the educational system there in Babylon, he would have learned these things, which were, according to the Old Testament, abhorrent to God. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 20, it says, In every matter... Of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than who? 
all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. The second thing that indicates um, they were almost completely, and we're going to get to the part, don't worry. I know you're like, wait, what are you talking about? Daniel does stand up for his faith, um, and he pays a heavy price for it. But the other thing that indicates that for the most part, except when we reach these very ex this extreme line, we'll get to that line, um, for the most part, Daniel and his friends led a quiet life or attempted to lead a quiet life in when they were surrounded by a pagan government and pagan authorities and um, uh, a complete and total pagan environment. One of the things that happens that indicates this is that he allows his name to be changed and he goes by a pagan name. And you're like, oh, well, what's that? Is that a big deal? If you've been tuning in, you know, as we went back, you know, some of those other um, lessons that we've had, that changing your name was an incredibly big deal in the ancient Near East. Name was deeply and intimately tied to your identity, and not only that, tied to your national god. And in Daniel's case, the national god was Yahweh. And so the very end of his name, Daniel, E-L, L is for Elohim, just like in my name, Samuel. El is for Elohim. And so to take that out of his name was extremely um, important. And it's also a, a moment of brainwashing. It reminded me of uh, that classic movie Roots. I don't know if you've seen that. And they actually did a remaking of it as well. But there's a, a particular scene that sticks in my mind. And that is when they, they um, the, basically the slavers go over to Africa and they take people from their villages over in Gambia and one of the guys that they they steal and they basically force into slavery very similar scenario to what happened to Daniel and his friends um, their city is burned down they are taken basically away as slaves with no choice and his real name uh, his African name is Kunta Kinte and when he comes to America, one, he is surprised at the degree to which everyone around him, all the other slaves or the people that are there, have just accepted their fate, have just accepted their new names and their new identities and jettisoned um, their, their old ways of life from Africa where they had come from. And at one point, and it's, it's, I thought about showing you the clip, but it's just, it's too much for me. I can't, I couldn't, knowing that there's children at home and things like that, but you could go back and watch it if you wanted to. But he tries to escape, he's caught, and he is being whipped and tortured and, ab and abused. And what the slave owner is tr trying to get him to do is to go by a new name. He says, your new name is Toby. And so he, he hits him and he beats him. And actually he has another slave do it to him, which is even worse on a whole nother level. And he says, your new name is Toby. And he keeps asking him over and over again, what is your name? And in defiance, in a clinging to his identity and his culture and hope that he will one day return to his life and to his families and his relatives and his old way of life, he keeps saying, my name is Kunta Kinte. He refuses to say that his name is Toby. And he is continually beaten because of it. When he falls finally into the character Fiddler. Fiddler is, was played by Lou Gossett Jr. And in the remake, he's played by Forrest Whitaker. And if you haven't seen the remake, see that scene particularly because Forrest Whitaker is just amazing. But he says to him, Fiddler, that character says, it doesn't matter what the master calls you. You keep your true name inside of you. This ain't your home, but it's where you gotta be. Your name was extremely important. And in our case, the name Daniel, which means God is my judge, becomes Belteshazzar. Either may a god, um, likely one of the Babylonian god names, protect his life, or lady, a goddess, protect the king. His friends named Azariah, Yah is my help, Yahweh is my help, becomes Abednego, which is basically a... Um, a distortion of the form of, of a servant of Nabu. Hananiah, Yahweh has been gracious, and Mishael, who is 
what God is becomes Shadrach and Meshach. And basically what's happened here is they have attempted to give these Judean youths a new identity and a new allegiance. And they have bestowed names that associate them with Babylonian gods. Could you imagine for a moment, again, you're taken off to Russia and you are told that you're, or let's pick Iran. You're taken off to Iran and your name is changed from a name like Christopher, Christ uh, bearer, and instead become something that means praise Allah. And they do not rebel. <coughs> Excuse me. They do not fight back. They allow this to happen. We do not see protest. Their overall approach in the pagan context is to live a quiet life. And it reminds me of the writings of the New Testament. In fact, um, I, at one of the churches, I remember I was playing, um, and, and if you don't remember, I only became a believer in my late, in my um, yeah, middle, mid to late 20s. Um, and so I didn't grow up in Christian culture. I didn't realize I was supposed to have a theme verse uh, for my life. That's like a thing you're supposed to have. Um, and so later in life, I was actually interviewing for a pastor. Because they were like, what's your theme verse? I was like, oh, I better come up with one. And so a um, couple of things. One, this is my theme verse. <laughs> Two, this is the admonition of Paul to Christians living in a completely pagan context. And friends, let me just take a small aside for a second. Reminder, just reminder. And Tommy's mentioned this in his devotions. We are not in a completely pagan context. I know the, there's a lot going on right now. And there is a tendency sometimes in hyper-conservative circles to say that everybody is against us and, and, and that Christians have it the worst. But we are actually in, a, in the history of the world, if we, take, if we step back for a second and take a broad view of history and a broad view of missions in the world, um, our government right now is very, very favorable towards Christians. Very favorable. We are not living in this context. But, the, but um, Daniel was, and also Paul and the early Christians in the Roman Empire absolutely were. And this is what Paul writes. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we have instructed. Why? So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So a couple of things. One, don't be dependent upon others. But, but two, it's part of our witness. And if, if you didn't hear a couple of, uh, so last Tuesday, I lose track. Last Tuesday, I think um, I, I did a devotional on the governing authorities and a reminder that Really, the drive behind this, and friends, the drive behind everything for us as Christians in the New Testament era, everything for us as Christians living today is, the, is, is how does this affect our witness? How does our behavior, the way in which we live our lives, either promote God's mission or detract from it? How does it, as our primary enemies are the principalities and spiritual forces of this age, how do our actions primarily um, motivate people to hear the gospel, to hear the good news, and not put a stumbling block in their way? And so we see that with Daniel, we see it with Paul, and it is a reminder, even though we don't live in a completely pagan government cultural situation, it's a reminder to us as well to aspire to live quietly so that we might walk properly before outsiders. Now, I told you that a line was going to be reached, and absolutely a line is reached. It takes a while. Again, think of all these dramatic things. They've been stolen from their home. They've been raised. They're, they're learning about divination um, and, uh, uh, and try how to interpret a liver. They are having their names changed from names that reflect Yahweh to the names that reflect foreign gods. But here a line is reached. It's done because of political manipulations. But the line is reached only when Daniel is prohibited from praying to God at all. 
It's not that he's prohibited from praying to God um, in schools. It's not that he's prohibited from praying to God in the government, in the Capitol building. It's not that he's prohibited from praying to God um, in certain areas or at certain times. It is that he is prohibited from praying to God at all. Um, and in the New Testament, friend, this was also the line for the New Testament church uh, or, or the church, the, excuse me, the early centuries church is they only drew the line when Caesar finally passed an edict which said, you must worship me. This becomes the line and it is the line for Daniel, even though it is done quietly and without fanfare. Even so, we notice the quiet faithfulness of Daniel. Here we revisit a theme that is encountered for the first time in chapter 1. Daniel does not grandstand for the faith, but neither does he try to hide his love of the Lord. He does not go to the public square or the court to flaunt his rejection of Darius's decree. Rather, he went as usual, verse 10, to his upstairs room, but at the same time, he does not close his windows so that no one could observe his prayers. It would take some effort, like those exerted by his conspirators. But Daniel was not taking any extraordinary measures to hide his lack of compliance to this particular decree. He will obey the law of God in this case, not the law of the Medes and the Persians with which it conflicts. When we reach a point, and we have, again, we have not reached that point here in the United States. There are nations, talk to some of our mission partners, where this is the case, where you do reach a place, and hopefully it won't happen in our lifetime. But there will be a, a, that time and place, even in this nation, where the line is reached, where we are told we are not allowed to pray to God where we are not allowed to worship him, or we must pray to something else, or we must worship someone else. And when that occurs, we as faithful followers of Jesus Christ have to, will, totally put our trust, our lives even, in the hands of God. And knowing that the cost of our faithfulness will be great indeed. And Daniel did this knowing. He knew the law. Are you kidding? He's at the highest levels of government. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew the political schemes that were going on. He knew that if he prayed to Yahweh, that the price that he would pay, the cost, would be his life. The cost of faithfulness was great. In a word, Daniel would rather be eaten by lions than stop praying to God. A couple of things come to mind when I say that. One, reflect ourselves. It's hard because we're not in that circumstance, right? We're very privileged. Would we be able to do that? Would you and I be able? It's, you, it's hard to say unless you were in that moment. I like to believe, I hope that I would have the faithfulness and the strength to say, I would rather be eaten by lions than not pray to my God. Second, Look at what Daniel is willing to do for prayer. Prayer, which we take for granted in so many ways. We, I myself am guilty of not regularly going before the throne of the king of heaven and beseeching him and praying to him. We who regularly take that for granted, we cast it aside and treat it like dirt. Daniel is willing to die for it. Daniel is faithful. And that is the basic message of this chapter. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. Remain faithful to God. Wherever you are, whatever is going on in your life, pray to him and stay faithful to what you believe in, what you know, confirmed by scripture and the Holy Spirit and other believers around you. Stay faithful to, the God, to God and remain faithful and God will take care of you. Daniel is faithful, but friends, more importantly, God is faithful. God is the main character here. God is the rescuer. The book of Daniel, above all, think again about these incredible circumstances where they have been 
The nation of Israel, Jerusalem, the capital of Yahweh, has been destroyed. The temple broken, every last stone thrown to the ground. Is God still in control? And the resounding answer through the book of Daniel is yes, he is. The message of Daniel is that God is all powerful. And he is in control in spite of present conditions. And I know we are in insane conditions right now. And so if you don't hear anything else this morning, hear this from the word of God, that God is in control, that God is all powerful, that God holds you in his hand, that he can bear the weight of the politics, of the coronavirus, of the conspiracy theories, of whatever it is, that he can bear it all. And that he holds you in your hands. And that in spite of the present conditions, he's got this. He's got this too. Despite present appearances in the book of Daniel, God is indeed in control. Regardless of the fact that incredibly powerful political forces move against Daniel, God preserves him from their clutches. In spite of the fact that the law of the Medes and the Persians have condemned him to death, God preserves his life. Regardless of the fact that the lions are hungry, God does not allow them to even scratch Daniel's skin. God is indeed in control. Darius, at that time, the most powerful human in the entire world has no power to save Daniel. But Daniel's faith is founded on a person who is more powerful than that king, the king of heavens, God himself. And of course, this story, like all of the Old Testament, is a foretelling, a foreshadowing of a greater story that is yet to come. As Daniel was framed on false charges by the Persian administrators, so Jesus would be framed by the religious leaders of his day as they reported him to Roman authorities, saying that he was claiming to have the authority of title of king of the Jews. Jesus, like Daniel, was arrested while at the prayer. He was arrested while praying in a private location, the Garden of Gethsemane. Pilate, like Darius, worked for his release. But in the end, both Daniel and Jesus are turned over to be executed. The big difference between the two is that Daniel emerges without a scratch while Jesus dies. The stone is rolled over the lion's den. The stone is rolled over the tomb of Jesus. Yet the difference is what underlies the superiority of the reality from the shadow. Jesus dies, yet he emerges from the tomb. Now, now we, you and I, can see the power that allows us to risk everything, even our lives, for our faith. Yes, to live quiet lives, but also to be unafraid to live faithful lives when those lines may finally be crossed. And to support our brothers and sisters where those nations and those places where they are. Jesus has not only gone into the lion's den and emerged unscathed, but he has died and been raised again. Trimper Longman, an Old Testament scholar, theologian, professor, author, amazing guy, says this. Our faith gives us the courage to risk all, even death. Christians living in the West have not been tested to risk all. Often we act as if we are unwilling to risk anything. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters who today risk much. And we must ask the Lord to make us ready when our day of testing comes. Our willingness to risk even our lives is what will turn the head of the secular culture that surrounds us. Our complaints, our legislative efforts, our attempts to compel people to live according to our standard of morality will only close their ears. The power of quiet faithfulness 
is impressed upon us in the closing words of Darius in Daniel chapter 6, 26 through 27. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lion. This is the outcome of Daniel's faithfulness, of, and more importantly, of God's faithfulness. God's name is proclaimed from the highest authority in all the land to a nation of unbelievers. Again, going back to our imaginary scenario, you're taken to North Korea, you are, live a quiet, faithful life, you stand up when you have to, when the line is crossed and you're asked to worship or pray to some other God, and the result is that the entire nation is told about the living God. And in this time period, again, the largest nation of the time had conquered multitude of nations, proclaims throughout the world that Yahweh is the one true God. May our God find us as his disciples with the same faithfulness in our day-to-day -day lives. And may we put our trust and hope in him and him alone as we go forward from here this day. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, grant us your spirit. May we learn not only from the example of Daniel, but may we also learn more about who you are. May we be encouraged to put our trust in you more and more each day, no matter where the winds blow, May we stand firm upon the solid rock, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Be at work within our hearts that we may quietly reflect your kingdom, your values, your love and grace to a world that desperately needs you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time in the service is when, if we were gathered together, we would um, take the offering. And let me just remind, remind you or just say again, I can't say this enough. Always talking about money is super awkward for me. I don't like to do it. I think the church as a whole has had a really rough history, uh, to say the least. Um, but let me just say it again. Thank you so much for your faithfulness, for you continuing to support us. For us being able to double the amount of Thanksgiving and Christmas bags we're giving out through the Deacon Fund. For us to continue to, to pay for our staff and to look forward into the next year. Um, anticipating that we will continually be able to fund our ministry and our mission. So that we might be, particularly here, surrounded by these, other, these neighborhoods and cities. That we might be a voice for Jesus. And that we might continually to proclaim his name and to point people to the gospel. And as a reminder, December 1st is something that's called Giving Tuesday. It's this online movement where people give uh, to nonprofits and things like that. So if you're participating in Giving Tuesday, or even if you're not, consider December 1st making a gift uh, to us. And you can go to newhopekent.org slash giving in order to do that. Now, as we uh, come to the end of our service, our profession of faith today comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, the Heidelberg Teaching. Question number 127. And the question is about the Lord's Prayer. Um, and it's a different translation, but the, the translation we usually use is honing in on this verse. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So the question, and I encourage you as a family, as a home group, stand up, say this together, even if you're alone. Say this. We are all saying this together right now as a family of faith. And by the way, this quick aside, I know I've been way too long. I'm sure I can hear it right now in my ear. Uh, amazing. Last, the last time we gathered and get together, we didn't plan this, but I was online at the same time that I was present in the sanctuary. And we said the prayer of confession at the exact same time together. And it was very impactful, if it's just for me, to know that wherever you are, that we are all saying these words together, professing our faith together. Sorry, rant over. Question number 127. What does the sixth petition mean? I hope this is encouragement. Here's the answer. Let's say it together. And do not bring us to the time of trial 
but rescue us from the evil one, means by ourselves we are too weak to hold our own even for a moment. And our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong with the strength of your Holy Spirit, so that we may not go down to defeat in this spiritual struggle, but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. Friends, please join us next week, Sunday at 10 a.m. right here. Uh, Pastor Tommy will be kicking us off with Advent, again, online service only as we look at God's messenger, the story of Jonah. And as we conclude our time here, let me just, and I'm going to read here from the, the Storybook Bible on page 159. Ultimately, Daniel, like every other book in the Bible, frankly, is about one character, not Daniel. It is about God. And the book of Daniel, our passage today, reveals God in the context of relationship as rescuer. And so the Storybook Bible ends on page 159 like this. God would keep on rescuing his people. And the time was coming when God would send another brave hero like Daniel, who would love God and do what God said, whatever it cost him, even if it meant he would die. And together, they would pull off the greatest rescue the world has ever known. Amen and amen. And before, I, one last thing before I do the blessing. If you want to sing some songs along with our worship band, here's the link right here. That will take you to some of our resources if you want to sing some worship songs together. Now, as you go forward from here, may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be on us all as we go forward proclaiming Jesus' name as we live a quiet life and pointing others to the triune God. Amen.